Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Today, I have with me David A.J. Richards and James Gilligan, authors of Holding Up a Mirror to Nature, Shame, Guilt, and Violence in Shakespeare. James Gilligan is a psychiatrist who has specialized in the study of violence. And David Richards is a professor of law who has critiqued the criminal justice system, which our society has claimed is an attempt to solve the problem of violence. David and Jim, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start off chatting a little bit about the audiobook process. I know that at the time of this recording, uh, the audiobook is still in production, so you haven't really had a chance to listen to the finished audio yet. But early on, when we first talked, you seemed to have a fairly good idea coming into the project about who you wanted to narrate. Could you elaborate on the casting process or on the casting? Well, for me, it was because I saw John Douglas Thompson. I've, I've seen him in several performances in New York City, but I was absolutely bowled over by his performance as Shylock mm-hmm. in Merchant of Venice, which was done in Brooklyn. I thought it was an amazing performance. I mean, to see a play dealing with, I mean, Shylock, who's a sort of absolutely central character uh, in that play, being played by a man of color mm-hmm. was really astonishing what he brought to the role. I was really bowled over by it. I, I've seen many uh, performances of Merchant of Venice. But I had never seen anything like it. It was so extraordinary what he captured about the experience of someone like Shylock, who, who of course, had been humiliated and uh, is really responding to it and his suffering is, uh, was just amazing. And I think as soon, I mean, uh, when Jim and I were talking about whom we would like to play, the various Shakespeare performances. His name immediately came to my mind. I've seen Nigel in some things he did with a friend of ours, uh, Tina Packer. Mm. Wonderful thing where they uh, they do the various male female roles in Shakespeare. It's really it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and he was terrific. Mm. Uh, Jim, well, I can only reinforce what you've just said. I've known uh, the work of all three of the uh, people that uh, have put together this audio book, John Douglas Thompson, uh, Nigel Gore, and Toddy, and I've known all of their work because I'm very close to Tina Packer and uh, her company, the uh, Shakespeare yeah. Company, uh, in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts yeah. for, oh my gosh, the past several mm. decades. So I've seen all three of them perform repeatedly uh, there and, and uh, in the work that uh, David just mentioned, uh, both in Massachusetts and uh, on the New York yeah. stage. Yeah. So I, I'd say all three of them are really our first choices for the roles they're playing. We feel so blessed and yeah. honored and fortunate that they have agreed to do this. And I will say, David, you know, when you talk about seeing John Douglas Thompson playing Shylock and how that particular role, I know that you highlight that in the book about how the shame, humiliation that is so central to the very issues that you bring out in the book. I can see why his name would immediately come to mind, having seen him play that incredible role. Oh, yes. Yeah. And certainly, I had the great delight to be able to work with him in the studio on his readings and certainly also experienced the depth of his performance in that role, as well as the others. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that, that you found it. Yeah. Because it's it, it, but, uh, Jim and I really uh, anticipated. Yeah, yeah. And these are all experienced Shakespearean actors. I would want to mention that. I mean, they've all been in multiple Shakespeare plays, so... For a book on Shakespeare, I think we could not have chosen three more appropriate and and, uh, experienced and skillful uh, actors. Clay, uh, I think it's very important to us, Becky, that plays are not meant to be read. They're meant to be experienced. There's a very, I mean, the theater is a communal form. There's a relationship between audience and it, which is really unique. It's something you don't get with movies, for example. It's something I always miss when I go to movies, communal. Uh, aspect of uh, uh, of theater. And since our book is essentially about these piercing performances of the psychology of 
uh, violent men, which Shakespeare sort of tracks almost from the beginning of his work to the very end, from Titus Andronicus right up to the last play that, that we know he wrote. And it seemed to us, given that it was that voice and which arrested Jim when he discovered uh, that Shakespeare was the sort of only good diagnostic he had mm -hmm. to understanding these extremely violent criminals he was trying to understand and help in Massachusetts. I mean, psychiatry didn't help him. There was nothing in the so-called scientific literature which helped him understand, but it was Shakespeare uh, to a, with this extremely sensitive reading of these violent men yeah. that I think illuminated for him how to diagnose uh, what was going on with these men, who I think really frightened him <laughs> first of <laughs> all <laughs> and mystified him yeah. uh, and then led him also to figure out a diagnostic technique, a, 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 a therapeutic technique, which actually helped them yeah. and did actually, a, to, an, to an astonishing degree, lower their propensity to violence. Mm. Yeah, you brought up a really interesting point there. I just want to highlight the community aspect. And we're really talking about people within a community where they're being shamed or humiliated and that then, you know, it's their response to that experience within their community. And here we have theater, Shakespeare, where Again, it's this live experience, I know exactly what you're talking about as a theater professional myself. There's something very unique and wonderful about being there in person, live with the performers. I just wanted to sort of highlight that because I think we... Shakespeare, I mean, Jim knows more about this than I do. Shakespeare is increasingly being used, actually, in prisons. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite remarkable how the, the prisoners, often very violent men, respond to it. Yeah actually see them. So, and Jim, in his therapeutic work with criminals, has used theater work. But Jim can speak about this with more authority than I can. Yeah. I would love to hear more, Jim, about your experience and sort of that discovery of how Shakespeare was the thing, right? The man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I discovered it in a number of ways. First, when I began realizing that the violent criminals that I was working with in the mental health programs and violence prevention programs in uh, beginning with the prisons in Massachusetts, I, I began to realize they had just walked out of Shakespeare's plays. I mean, I, I had seen Othello, I had seen Richard III, I had seen Edmund and King Lear and on and on, Macbeth and the, the, the hitmen Macbeth hires and all of these people I, I was seeing in the prisons. And I realized Shakespeare got there a good four centuries before I did. <laughs> in, in, in understanding what was going on, you know, really the intimate thought processes leading up to the acts of the identical kinds of violence that uh, the, the people I was seeing in the prisons uh, had committed, including the most horrendous violence that is almost intolerable to uh, be aware of. The, the, the blinding of Gloucester yeah. and King Lear. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. the audience can hardly stand the violence in, in some of Shakespeare's plays. Yes, yeah. the blinding of Gloucester and King Lear, the uh, uh, in Titus Andronicus, the cutting the tongue out of a woman they had raped, and, you know, on and on. But, you know, I was seeing people who had done this in real life. Mm. And uh, it changed my view of Shakespeare completely. When I was in college reading Shakespeare, I thought, oh, gee, this is interesting. He got, he basing his plays on you know, stories that other people had already told. It was all imaginary. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the usual psychoanalytic interpretation was, these are showing what goes on in the unconscious in the minds of normal, nonviolent people. Uh -huh. And and then I suddenly realized <laughs> that, that was missing the point. He was describing what actually goes on in the minds of people who are, who are violent. Yeah. Uh, and that was, a, that was a population that Freud and, and almost every psychoanalyst had not worked with directly. I was fortunate in having a teacher at the uh, in the Harvard Medical School where I was studying psychiatry who actually had worked with this group and, and uh, introduced me to the concept of trying to do mental health work in a prison setting. Mm. Of course, the worst possible place in which... <laughs> right. the scariest place, right? <laughs> but we were, you know, intent on, uh, what did I say, undoing the mistakes of the criminal justice system and the mental health system in America. Yeah, mm, yeah. And uh, so, yes, as David said, we uh, 
And you know, in many settings, I've uh, used or observed the use of Shakespeare in in plays. I mean, in prisons. In in uh, England, the the British equivalent of the prison mental hospital for the violent mentally ill or the so-called criminally insane a place called Broadmoor. And uh, uh, one of my closest friends there uh, who was doing exactly the same work there I was doing in Massachusetts. Uh, brought the Royal Shakespeare Company into Broadmoor to oh. perform plays for the uh, patients there who were astonished to realize that they were seeing performed on the stage the same kinds of crimes they had committed, the same kinds of violence. Mm. And uh, in in Boston, uh, one of the uh, students at, from Shakespeare and Company uh, in, in Western Massachusetts was working with uh, street gangs in, in Boston, youth gangs. And having them, he would direct them in Shakespeare plays. And they performed one of these, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, before a class that my, my wife was teaching there. And one of these gang members described how the language of Shakespeare was so astonishing to him. It made him realize that you could express your feelings in words. You didn't have to use your fists or weapons in order to communicate your feelings and express your feelings. Wow. And that the words alone, you know, it, it gave him an alternative to just, you know, violent action. And uh, I've seen this uh, happen. I, I could give you a dozen examples of Shakespeare in prisons, either performed by prisoners or as uh, an audience to uh, professional actors performing them, or writing one-act plays themselves about their own lives as kind of a spin-off from Mm. this, which which we did in the uh, jails of San Francisco with great success. Mm. But the the theater is a a stage in which, well, as Shakespeare says, (laughs) all the world's a stage. And all the men and yeah. women are, are actors. Right. And it enables, you know, writing a play or acting in a play or observing a play provides a way to kind of objectify what is otherwise completely subjective experience. I mean, you can you bring it out into the open world, and then you can think about it. And what the violent inmates I was working with realized also that if you're writing the play, you can rewrite it. You can change the ending. You can create a different plot. So that uh, they had felt in the events leading up to their crimes and, and their own violence that they had no choice but course, to do what yeah. they did. Right. And then when they wrote this as a play about their own lives and what had turned them toward a life of violence, they realized they actually could rewrite the play and, mm-hmm. and uh, create a different ending. I mean, the, the, the theater is a wonderfully flexible and and powerful context in which people can really re un, first of all understand themselves right. and then realize how they themselves can grow and develop and change mm, that is so powerful i think there there are, there are two things i think uh, Becky, that emerge from from the work with these violent criminals first he i think he discovered that their violence was their voice they had no voice and uh, in his work with them, it, which was essentially psychoanalytic, and he, when he elicited a voice from them, often uh, telling stories of, of unspeakable trauma, they actually, their vi- the violence mm. levels lowered. Uh, that by through helping them discover a, a, a personal voice, which they had never used, they actually, you, you're addressing the root causes uh, of their violence. The other thing I think, this is, the idea of communalization was is a central theme in in the work of the psychiatrist Shays with uh, uh, PTSD survivors. And what he discovered in his therapeutic work is that uh, individual therapy didn't help these uh, often, let's say, uh, s- uh, soldiers from Vietnam who were suffering from PTSD. But it is it's communalization when they discussed with other men uh, that they who had shared exactly the same right. phenomenon that there was a possibility of actually addressing what they were suffering from. So communalization, and the theater is a communal form. And I think Jim is, at, and I think part of w- why generations are fascinated with him is that he gives you this insight uh, in a communal way with 
the continuing problem of violence. It was a problem in Shakespeare's time, you know, and it was it's a continuing problem in our time. America is one of the most violent so-called democracies in the world. And uh, it, I think uh, his work on violence still speaks to us as Americans uh, about our continuing problems, you know, and, you know, the problems in our leadership, uh, some of whom, like Trump, remind one of people yeah. in Shakespeare, to be frank yeah. with you. <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm really curious now, uh, Jim, you mentioned that maybe college was the place where Shakespeare was sort of your, your introduction to Shakespeare. Is that is that true? Or is, that's when you were reading? Oh, yes. No, I, I took a wonderful course in which we read all of uh, Shakespeare's plays with one of the great Shakespeare scholars of the 20th century, Harry Levin, mm-hmm. who really got an introduction to, to the range uh, of his work. But as I said, it, it really simply had not occurred to me that how did Shakespeare know this stuff? I mean, how did it learn it? <laughs> and when, it me, you know, when I started working in the American prisons, and then later in English ones, and I've visited prisons around the world, that the, a guy like Shakespeare or, or the Greek tragedians, hmm. you know, Sophocles and the others, they weren't simply, you know, echoing myths and stories that had existed before them. They, they might build their plots on those, but they filled them in with an understanding of what was going on within the minds of these violent people. Right, right. And incidentally, tragedy is always about violence. Mm. Uh, tragedy ends in violent death, uh, both for the victims of the protagonist and often the protagonist himself. And it almost always is a him, ex- with exceptions mm-hmm. like Medea. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. most of them are, are men, and, and that's true in real life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the great gifts of, you know, that great playwrights, great actors, that it is very much about that thinking process that they're tapping into. They have an insight into and can can connect with that, that thought process inside the characters that makes it astonishing. I, I myself assume I mean, Shakespeare, you know, intimately knew uh, Elizabeth's court. And the sort of central tragedy for Elizabethans near the end of her life was that the man she loved, uh, Essex, turns on her and betrays her, and uh, she has to execute him. And I mean, Shakespeare knew these men. I mean, uh, I think um, some of them perhaps even intimately. And the question arises for any Elizabethan, how had these towering figures like Essex, who probably thought he should be the, the king of England after uh, Elizabeth. How had he destroyed himself and destroy uh, such that? And how could he betray her? And uh, I think this was a not uncommon problem in the Elizabethan period. She is a queen, right? I think Essex thought, you know, I'm a man. I can do, you know, in fact, she was one of the best rulers England ever had. But you can see Shakespeare was studying yeah. these men. Uh, and I think Elizabethans were fascinated. How had this happened? That this man, they had, I mean, Essex was very popular, you know, in the late 1590s. And here this hero becomes a yeah. monster. Yeah. He turning on this old woman yeah. who loved him. She has to execute him. And to build on what uh, David just said, I concluded that the only way Shakespeare could have understood the thought processes of the leading up to the violence and the emotional processes was because. This had actually been occurring in real life all around him. Mm. When I first started working in the prisons, I was um, struck by the fact that the people I was seeing had really been walking the streets, you know, the same streets that I and my wife and children walked, you know, shortly before they committed their crimes and got sent to prison. Shakespeare must have known people or known people who did know them, who had committed the actual kinds of crimes. You know, the murders, the mutilations, and the suicides, and on and on, that, you know, that he describes in, in his plays. So this was not based just on imagination or some pre-existing myth. It, it, it came from knowing and observing and describing and transcribing what was actually going on in, in, in the minds of these real people. Yeah. 
I, I, I do think Jim's work shows how artificial the line is between science and literature. Because when it comes at least to the human sciences, Jim, in trying to understand the problem of violence, found nothing in the so-called psychiatric, psychiatric that yeah. helped him. Uh, whereas literature did help him. I mean, I mean, I think Jim is to, to some extent like Leonardo. He works in the sciences and he works right. in the arts. And there, it's all one. Yeah. And the sooner we overcome these ridiculous divisions between science and literature, the better we'll understand the, the yeah. human psyche, you know, I mean, which is what great literature really right. studies. Yeah. Uh, David, so. I'm curious, when did when were you introduced to Shakespeare? When I was, I was studying in England after Harvard College, I was given a scholarship to study at Oxford, and I stayed for two years, and I, and I started. I had never realized what theater was till I lived in Britain. Because, I mean, theater is at the center of the culture. And then I discovered really good Shakespeare, which you can very, which at least when I was 40, this was 50 years ago, uh, I had never seen decent performances of Shakespeare. And I was just mm -hmm. astonished. By, by what I was seeing. You mean you would, you, there would be a time in London or at, in Oxford where you would see three performances yeah. of King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> and they all were yeah. very good. And, you know, and the, you know, I, I thought it was, a, and of course the, the British theater is quite, is a, as you know, is a political theater, rather more political than our theater yeah. tends mm -hmm. to be. And Shakespeare is, is a, in many ways a political right. playwright. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I realized the power of theater. I went to the theater in New York, but you very rarely saw Shakespeare. Yeah. And how did you two connect with each other? Where did that begin? I had been teaching with Carol Gilligan, Jim's wife, for 20 years. We'd given a course called Resisting Injustice, and I had met Jim. And then one evening when I was puzzling over what to do, I said to Jim, maybe we should teach a course together, Jim. Uh, and we began by studying the problem of retributivism from a philosophical and psychological point of view. And then as we talked, you know, it was clear that for Jim, Shakespeare was very important. And I said, well, let's do Shakespeare. Uh -huh. And that's when this started. I think we, we, we taught it for three, for three yeah. or four years. And then we started writing yeah. this book. Let's take a short pause and we'll be right back with David A.J. Richards and James Gilligan, authors of Holding Up a Mirror to Nature, Shame, Guilt, and Violence in Shakespeare. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out or at least shrink the middleman, yet you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the price you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com in the marketing menu. And we're back. Writing a book solo, which obviously both of you have done multiple times, is one thing, you know, where you're really just relying on, you know, your own. But writing a book collaboratively is a whole different beast and comes in many different flavors. Well, what was yours? But but Jim had a Jim has a has a general theory of violence. I mean, he started with these violent criminals, but he's developed a general theory of political violence that I think he's continuing to work on, and uh, in showing how these themes of humiliation apply to to politics and that framework, and particularly the transition from shame to guilt culture, to me explains so much in terms of problems of violence that. You know, I wrote a first draft of this, and then Jim wrote the second draft, which is essentially the book. And I think, I mean, I just, I find his view so illuminating, psychologically. I do think he's a sort of central figure uh, uh, in understanding violence. There's no one, I, the, at least the psychology yeah. of violence. He's filling a gap in the psychiatric literature, which uh, took seriously suicide, but has never really taken seriously homicide as an empirical. Matter. Freud, for example, never studied violent men. 
Uh, and essentially, he mythologizes it when he creates Thanatos, the death instinct, which is not empirically based. And I do think, if I can use the word, the towering importance of Jim Gilligan's work is that he developed an empirically based theory of violence. Uh, it's totally based on empir uh, empirical observation, and it's been confirmed by many other co-workers in the field. And, and violence is, is one of our central problems. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. At uh, the personal and political level. And I thought it was so important to make this available to lawyers and to thinking citizens. So it, for me, working with Jim, it's always for me a discovery. That's so cool. Yes, he really he really has a profound mind and a very literary mind, which both of which appeal to me. So that was I'm always learning yeah, from. Yeah, you. that's great. <laughs> well, thank you, David. Uh, I I would have to say, though, this book would not have existed or come into being without David and his help. And uh, it truly was a collaboration. It is. It definitely was. You know. I think that is. That's great. What, what would you say? Yeah. You know, was there were there any challenges? There must have been challenges along the way. What What would you say, if anything, was the the biggest challenge in the process? Just the dealing with the process of the collaborative writing. Oh gosh. Well, I think for me, it was the way Jim used the plays to illuminate the possibility of mm -hmm. therapy. I, I really haven't seen. I mean, we uh, one of the plays that's very central in our in our course is Measure for Measure, which is Shakespeare's play that studies retributivism, and uh, that play could be studied in the form that Aeschylus, the Duke, is actually a kind of Jim-like mission. Vincentio, you mean? Vincentio, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was Jim's insight. I hadn't seen it. And I was, and then he traces it in the later chapters of our book in other characters. And it did persuade me. I mean, I, I thought of Vincentio more, you know, as a kind of Prospero okay. character, yeah. you know, observing and dramatizing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Jim actually helps you see that he's not only observing these violent people, including Angelo, but he's trying to turn them away from yeah. violence. <laughs> There's no death in Measure for Measure. Yeah. The, the punishment is marriage, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare's irony. That's great. You know? That's great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I do think Shakespeare, and what I try to emphasize in the in the book, and David and I both do, is that he not only shows us the causes of violence, he also shows how to prevent it. And in Measure for Measure, Vincentio. Instead of punishing the people who were at least threatening to commit, in one case, legalized murder, and all of whom were, you know, guilty of conspiring to to commit murders and so forth, instead of punishing them, he basically turned them around toward in, instead of hate toward love. So the the play ends not in a group of murders, but a group of marriages yeah. and. Uh, the you know the character is a in some cases that's what they had wanted at the beginning and and he just was helping them realize their their real underlying goals and the others he showed how they could get what they want by embracing relationships and love not by means of force and and, and violence so I again I think you know if we want to learn about the causes and the prevention of violence. There's no better teacher than Shakespeare. But it, we, in a way, we've written this book as a kind of show and tell to, to use the lingo from grade school. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that Shakespeare shows us what is going on in the minds of people that leads to their committing acts of violence. All David and I are trying to do is to tell what he yeah. has shown us yeah. and to put in theoretical terms what he has absolutely. Uh, 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 shown us in detail. Well, to give an example, Freud apologized at one point for the fact that his uh, case studies, he said, read so often like short stories or novels, you know, yeah. fiction. And what I'm, David and I are trying to show in this book is that Shakespeare's fictions, his plays, can be read as if they were case histories. And the, the characters in them are exactly like the the uh, patient criminals that I was seeing in yeah. the prisons. So, but again, as I say, 
he got there four centuries before I did. And uh, all I can say, he, he, he confirmed uh, much of what I had seen and started thinking, and he showed me how to expand the thinking in, in more detail than I would have been able to yeah. on my own. The Measure for Measure is a wonderful play because, as you know, it ends with Vincentio, I mean, the Duke who's been observing all this, you know, in, in secret, and, and particularly observing Isabella, this sort of astonishing woman, yeah. soon to be a nun, who has this incredible confrontation with Angela, which in my opinion is one of the high points in Shakespeare, where she actually tells him what you're like, you are an ape in office, right? I mean, uh, you, at, at the end of the play, Vincentio proposes marriage to her. You know, it's one of those, it, there's a range of the way actresses treat that shock, etc. But it's the idea that even the, the therapist must love. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's true. Yeah. I mean, and that he finally sees this re- this remarkable woman. Yeah. What she yeah. is. You know, this brings yeah. me right to this uh, the question that I have. So, knowing that Shakespeare has provides us with some guidance in what it will take to turn the tide of violence, if you will, what do you see as like step number one for us, we humans? I would say. If we want to prevent violence, the main thing we need to do is to stop doing the things we have been doing that cause violence. That it, violence does not occur spontaneously. It is not an instinct. It's a defense against opposite instincts. Violence is a defense against the normal, and natural, and healthy instinct to love. As Freud commented, people are never as vulnerable as when they love. And I think we all know this from our own experience. As... Uh, well, to quote an unusual figure, to quote, I think what Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth II said after the, the catastrophe of the bombing of the World Trade Center Towers, that uh, grief is the price we pay for love. And uh, one of my mentors in uh, psychiatry reminded me that it's less painful to feel angry and hate than it is to feel sad. And that, that violence and hate are, are, are ways of trying to avoid the sadness that love inevitably makes us vulnerable to. And uh, I, I think Shakespeare you know, just illustrates this. But I think that's something we can apply. The way I would say, if we want to prevent violence, we have to stop humiliating people. We humiliate people when we commit acts of racial prejudice, when we regard African-Americans or Jews, or Mexicans, or Latinos, or Native Americans, or any other group as inferior, and and we humiliate them. And then the problem is, the really violent, the most violent people are the ones, the political leaders, not the individual murderers, but the mass murderers, who may never kill anybody themselves, but who incite their followers to commit murder which we, every major political leader we know of does that. They incite their followers to commit violent crimes. They don't do it themselves. Hitler to Trump. <laughs> yeah, Hitler to Trump. Yeah. Hitler came to power on the campaign promise to undo what he called the shame of Versailles, meaning we felt the whole nation of Germany had been shamed by the t- peace treaty terms of the Treaty of Versailles. To, to- Osama bin Laden described the motives for the World Trade Center tower attacks on 9-11. As the, this was the way to undo what he called 80 years of contempt and humiliation to which he said the entire Islamic nation had been subjected by the Western powers. Uh, Vladimir Putin described his motives for committing the same kind of scorched earth war against Chechnya, Chechnya that he now is in Ukraine as saying that it was a way to undo the humiliation of Russia's national pride by the Western powers after the uh, Russia of uh, the Soviet Union had lost the uh, the Cold War. And, of course, we know that Trump came to power on the same kind of campaign promise that Hitler did. Hitler talked about overcoming the shame of that Germany had suffered from the peace treaty of Versailles. Trump said, the Democrats had made America the laughing stock of the world. In other words, he was also saying that our country had been exposed to humiliation and shame, ridicule, uh, because of, of his enemies. So I'd say every violent political leader 
is appealing to the shame that people experience or that he says they experience and that they feel. I'm sorry, go ahead. There, there's another aspect of Jim's work, that certainly with these violent men, that he always emphasizes, and that is that education is the single thing that he has found in his work really enables violent, these, these violent criminals to change. And I think Jim should speak about that because that's a discovery he came to. Yeah, yeah. In his work. Yes, let, let me emphasize. I, I mentioned first, we need to stop humiliating people if we want to prevent violence. But the other thing, as David just was referring to, we also need to make available to people nonviolent resources for building up their sense of self esteem and self worth and, and pride in themselves. And nothing is a more direct way to do that than through education. Yeah. That's how all of us, starting in grade school, can develop a sense of self-esteem and confidence uh, when we develop knowledge and skills that we're taught in, in, in schools. So what, what I discovered when I surveyed what programs in the Massachusetts prisons had been most effective in preventing violence, particularly the violence of prisoners after they left the prison, I found one program that had been 100% successful over a 25-year period in the people who had participated in this program, not one of them had been returned to prison anywhere in wow. the country. And that was getting a college education and a college degree while in prison. Uh, professors from Boston University had been donating their time for free mm -hmm. to the state to teach college credit courses in the prisons. And several hundred prisoners, men who had committed murders and rapes and were finally released sometimes after you know, 14 or 15 years in prison. Not one of them returned to prison. And what struck me was that's hardly surprising because education is really the most direct way for people to build up an internalized source of self-esteem that nobody can take yeah. away from them. Nobody can deprive you of the education you yes. received. Yes. Oh, that is so beautiful. I, you know, I feel like I could uh, just continue talking with you guys for hours and hours, but uh, I want to uh, honor our time here together. Could you, uh, David, if you'd like to let our listeners uh, know about where they could learn more, your website, where they can learn more about you, your book, your work. Uh, I think our website is called understandingviolence.org, and you'll see there a, a, a very full description of each of our backgrounds and about this book and other things uh, that, that we put on there. But that's a very, it, it has a very complete description of both our background and the various other works we have, uh, we have, we have done. I think that would be the best single way. Right, right. If they want to pursue. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. So again, this is uh, David A.J. Richards and James Gilligan, authors of Holding Up a Mirror to Nature, Shame, Guilt, and Violence in Shakespeare. David and Jim, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beck. This is terrific. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.